section from a chapter in a nonfiction uh, environmental memoir I've just completed, and, and she's referring to me killing Privet, which I make brief reference to in the selection I'm <laughs> reading for y'all today. Singing has provided my way out of black moods throughout my life, singing and hard work. Or the two combined, Camille Sanson, composer of music lush in the way only the French can do lushness, once told a friend, I like good company, but I like hard work better. I think I'd like working near Saint-Saëns. He'd be singing to himself too, stopping and starting over, trying to remember the words to the fourth line of the third verse of that old French carol. His dogs would stop and look at him with disgust, just as my dogs, Fred and Max, do with me. Get it right, would you? You're messing up the rhythm of our running around in the woods. Fred and Max let me know which songs to sing. There are words and tunes and rhythms fit for walking through the woods, and others not so. Every occasion has its soundtrack. Kneading bread calls for a steady, hard-driving beat. And it's one, two, three, what are we fighting for? <laughs> I can punch that dough to elasticity in two or three repeats of the chorus. Jogging and fast walking, however, require a lively song that rounds back on itself. I'll be somewhere working, I'll be somewhere working, I'll be somewhere working for my Lord. The last two hours of a solitary ten-hour car ride can be saved from hellishness simply by crooning all the verses in their right order of Come thou fount of every blessing, or pop the magic dragon by the sea. And of course, babies are eased into dreaming with any song that's soft and lilting and repetitive. My daughter, Snow, always gave up the good fight after only a few verses of We Shall Overcome. <laughs> Snow, lifetime veteran of folk festivals, swears she can tell what time it is by what's being played or sung at late night jams. Before the midnight hour, fiddlers huddle their chairs in a tight circle of touching knees and work themselves to a lather on whiskey for breakfast while the singers talk and drink. From midnight until one, fiddlers and singers settle down to Barbary Allen, the LN don't stop here, and she walks these hills. One, one in the morning and until two or two thirty is the gospel hour, beginning with angel band and ending with close harmony on amazing grace. <laughs> Any bulky still functioning after two AM attempt to belt out Beatle tunes, Rocky Raccoon being the hands down favorite, but we can always only recall one and a half verses. Of course, the point is that no one at a music jam cares one hoop what time it is. I'll give up sleeping in favor of singing any time. A newcomer to one of these music weekends once asked, when do you sleep? We don't, was the quick answer. We just lie in bed for a couple of hours and vibrate. <laughs> when you can spend the night singing, sleep is redundant. Both serve equally well to knit up that, that raveled sleeve of care. So I sing, and my anger goes away, and my blood pressure hums along steady, and the tangles in my current writing project smooth out in the, into the needed words, which are now so obvious I can't believe I was struggling to find them. Singing engenders wholeness. I'm not the first to believe this. Plato and his Republic proposed training children with musical skills during their earliest years of education. Their minds would thereby, Plato argued, be primed for study of mathematics and science. Music orders our brains for productivity. I have a hard time convincing most people of this. I, have, I often have a hard time even getting people to let me finish singing when I'm away from places like folk festivals where everyone is walking around singing. You try it sometime. Walk down the hall at work quietly singing in the garden and see if you aren't interrupted before. And he walks with me and he talks with me. I can't decide if singing outside of church and summer camp somehow embarrasses people too much in the same way as if I showed up for work in a flowered nighty, or if it's if most people read most Americans just never sing. People who do not sing place little value on singing. I'm finding the same truth holds when it comes to valuing processes within nature. My fellow Americans think nothing of interrupting me when I'm singing because they view my singing as frivolous time filler rather than as the hum of my creative motor. I know the truth. Singing is an indicator that I'm working. But we of the 21st century are becoming blind to indicators. 
My 15-foot crepe myrtles are indicators that their roots have room enough to spread out, to touch toenails with the massive dogwood a little ways down the field. Those flat-topped crepe myrtles in the bank parking lot with their feet in cement shoes are choking to death. Only extreme arrogance allows us humans to believe forests will remain where we have pushed them. Out of the wildness, there will come a protest in some form or another. Nature is a singer with perfect pitch. Any disharmony pains the earth like a sour note. Natural gas emissions are a sour note, and our thinning ozone layer is Earth's wince of displeasure. Blankets of impermeable pavement are tone-deaf singers, and stunted shrubs are Earth's closed ears. Acres of clear-cut tree canopies are forgotten lyrics, and urban heat islands are Earth's fit of frustration. Ambient light is a monotone blat, and Earth's stars turn away like a disgruntled audience. When my family came to live at Grace Farm, our woods held nights as black as any ocean depths you may have known. The nights were such deep sea dark, we slept in endlessness defined by stars. But then the subdivisions came and staked their space with street lamps whose hazy lights spilled into our luscious darkness, heralding the dimming of our stars. Then why do I keep plugging along, lone individual against a sea of developers? Because we fight for what we love. I love the small bit of wildness which flourishes on my 40 acres. Each day as I root out invader species of plants, as I reintroduce native flowers and trees, as I clear the creeks for the, for the sake of darters and salamanders, I am working to build back what has been lost. And is it building another way of fighting? Building is possibly the best way of fighting. Even my use of the word building to imply encouragement of loss of human control rather than the application of human coverings to Earth's surfaces is my way of fighting linear thinking. We do have a choice in how we live in our world. We can choose to share top billing, to sing a duet rather than a solo. Every time I get to wondering what earthly difference I can make, I think about privet. I may sometimes believe I have broken the back of Privet's root system, but somewhere on another boggy acre of my land, a new stand of Privet is rising, strong and vital, in a way that heartens me. A few weeks ago, I spent late night hours with a group of friends, musicians all. These are people who probably don't go to the bathroom without bringing a fiddle in case there's someone in there wanting to jam. <laughs> or maybe wanting to dance, in my case. <laughs> On the first note of the first waltz they play, I pulled Jim Webb up by the hand and waltz with me. Sorry I'm not a better waltzer, he mumbled. Oh, you're fine, basically. But, he said, there must be more to it than just walking around in a square in time to the music. There is. The more intricate steps and the deeper feel for how to move with the music come with time and practice and a lot of wrong steps. It has taken me 20 years to learn to waltz. It may take me 20 years more to learn to, to keep in step gracefully with the music of my land. But what else is a lifetime for? Okay.